need to click in this window to be able to start. Okay, <clears throat> first topic I want to talk about today is the many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics. You ever the third proposed a many worlds theory in 1957. And he is widely uh, credited as the inventor of the many worlds view. It's less known that Erwin Schrödinger already proposed a different many worlds theory in 1925. So let me introduce this um, Schrödinger's many worlds theory to you. <clears throat> so let me just say it's some physical theory. I will just tell you what it says. It says, in analogy to how I have presented other theories yesterday, <clears throat> formulated as a fundamental physical theory, pretending that's all the laws of the whole universe. Okay, but of, of course, it's just a non-relativistic theory. It says, the universe consists of a three-dimensional Euclidean space and a continuous distribution of matter in this three-dimensional space that changes with time t such that it has density given by a particular function, m of x and t. And this function <clears throat> is given by this formula in terms of a wave function, psi. Psi evolves according to the Schrodinger equation. And uh, the, the formula is uh, the same as what we had um, with, um, with GRWM yesterday. Um, so let me just uh, reiterate what it says. <clears throat> the wave function, a functional configuration space, when you form psi squared, it gives you a density in three n dimensions. Now you take the three dimensional marginal of this density. You project it to get a three dimensional density that is um, expressed here by saying, oh, you integrate out all of the Q variables except for QK, which you set equal to X, and X is the variable over here. And okay, there is some, um, some freedom as to which K to choose, so let's average over all Ks. Or we could also put some, some weights here, maybe the masses of the particles or some other weights. So here I, I just chose weights equal to one. <clears throat> um, or put differently, you could regard it as follows. For any particular configuration Q, you take the M function to be the sum of N delta functions. You put a delta peak for each particle, and then you average over psi square distribution. Okay, so this is a different way of looking at the same formula. So this already completes the definition of the theory. So this is Schrödinger's first quantum theory, or I will, to have a symbol for it, I will sometimes denote it by SM, kind of in analogy to GRWM. So here that would mean S means Schrödinger evolution, the Schrödinger equation governs the wave function, and the M means you have the matter density ontology, or the M function, that's what's, what you have in three dimensions, what's regarded as the primitive ontology, the ontology in three dimensions. <clears throat> so the ontology here would be two things, the wave function psi and the m function. So psi is in three n dimensions, m is in three dimensions. Here actually m is completely determined by psi. So uh, a difference compared to Bohmian mechanics is in Bohmian mechanics you need to specify initial conditions for the, um, for the particle positions even uh, after you have fixed the wave function. Here, once you fix the wave function, it is already completely determined what M is. Let's see somehow. Uh, okay. Um, so, Schrödinger, so I've, I've copied again the equation for M so we can look at it again. Schrödinger uh, proposed this theory in 1925 that is kind of very shortly after he proposed the Schrodinger equation. But he soon abandoned this theory because he thought it made wrong predictions. But actually, it makes correct predictions, just it has a many worlds character. <clears throat> so let me talk about uh, why this theory has a many worlds character and what, what the kind of consequences of these equations are. Consider first, a uh, wave function, psi, 
that is concentrated uh, on just um, uh, just one uh, region that correspond region in configuration space that corresponds to a particular macroscopic appearance. So let's assume let's consider a wave function that is concentrated in a region in configuration space where all these different configurations belonging to that region look macroscopically the same. So microscopically, they, they're different, about the exact position about this exact air molecule at this exact time. <clears throat> but uh, the, these, uh, these differences between the different configurations are of a microscopic nature, macroscopically, they look the same. Okay, then also this M function looks macroscopically exactly the same way these configurations look. That's because for any configuration where psi is non-zero, uh, think of these n delta peaks, okay, so associated with this point in configuration space is now an m function that consists of m delta peaks, n delta peaks, so this m function looks macroscopically like this configuration. And now we average over psi, but psi is non-zero only on neighboring configurations that look macroscopically the same. So when we average, well, then we get a continuous function M, but it looks macroscopically the same. The shape, uh, you have trees and cats and tables, the, the shapes, they all look the same. Okay, now consider a wave function that has several wave packets that are macroscopically different. For example, uh, the, the, uh, the wave function, uh, uh, a post-measurement wave function with different needle positions, or the wave function of Schrodinger's cat. So that's why I wrote down here, the wave function of Schrodinger's cat, two wave packets, one um, in a region in configuration space where you have configurations of live cats, the other in a region where you have configurations of dead cats. Now, <clears throat> um, the consequence for the M function, when you think about what happens to the M function then, you realize, oh, it's just a, a, a linear combination of the M function that you would have for the wave function of a dead cat and the M function that you would have for the wave function of a live cat. That's because the two packets don't overlap, they're disjoint in configuration space. <clears throat> Therefore, at any particular Q, <clears throat> Only one of these two contributions is non-zero. So uh, in, instead of putting the sum here, what the psi actually is, you can always put one or the other of the two contributions uh, depending on where your Q is. Okay, so you get this combination here. So this is just a mathematical consequence of this fundamental law of this theory. So that means that um, in this matter density, the matter that is there, half of the matter is a live cat and half of the matter is a dead cat. Okay, so you can say there is a live cat and there is a dead cat, but they don't interact with each other. They don't notice each other. They walk through each other like ghosts. Uh, why is that? That's because, um, well, um, the one contribution to the M function comes from those configurations of dead cats and uh, interaction occurs between different particles belonging to the same configuration. That's in the Schrodinger equation, but not between different configurations. These two contributions to the wave function, there are two contributions that are in other interpretations of quantum mechanics, parts of the wave function that are thought of as alternative outcomes of the experiment, alternative realities. The Bohmian cat is either dead or alive. And of course, <clears throat> they don't interact with each other. So these two contributions of the wave function don't interact with each other. They're in uh, separated, well-separated regions of configuration space. <clears throat> and <clears throat> the Schrodinger equation prescribes some interaction within the different degrees of freedom of the, of the wave function, but not between these two wave packets. That's <clears throat> why there's no interaction between these two contributions to the M function. Okay, 
So that is, although there's just one, in this theory, there's just one universe and one M function, the M function contains different contributions. As, and the, the, the things in these contributions, the cats and the people and the uh, apparatuses, they behave like they live in parallel worlds. They, um, uh, in each contribution to the M function, there, there may be cats and apparatuses and observers people, and they can end, interact with each other if they belong to the same world, but uh, uh, observers that belong to different worlds, they can't interact with each other. So that's a kind of verbal summary of um, the practical consequences of the equations that are the laws of the theory. Okay, so here, world is a kind of vague notion, but it actually means, well, contributions to the, um, uh, to the M function that come from macroscopically different parts of the wave function. Okay, so you can see why this theory has a many worlds character. Now, here's Everett, not knowing about Schrodinger's proposal, Everett advocated a many worlds view in 1957, but with a different ontology. Everett had in mind that only psi exists. And there are no beables in three space, no mass density. He didn't think of mass density. <clears throat> so as a symbol for that, I will write S0, S for Schrodinger evolution, the wave function psi evolves according to the Schrodinger equation. And zero means, oh, there are no uh, no, there's no primitive ontology, no further beables, nothing like an M function or flashes or trajectories, nothing in three space, just the wave function which lives in three N space. Good. Uh, why would you th think of something like that? Here, um, here's some words about the motivation. Uh, we've seen that in a measurement process, the wave function branches. Uh, you get these uh, different packets, um, this macroscopic superposition, the psi alphas, they no, never overlap again. <clears throat> if you have several measurements in a row, the picture looks like this. So here, the, uh, the right axis is just uh, symbolizes the three n dimensions of configuration space, the upper axis and the time axis. <clears throat> so what is shown here is the significant support of the, of the wave function. So the wave function tends to split into several packets, and then by decoherence, the packets don't overlap again. <clears throat> As you have further measurements or measurements-like situations, they will split further. So you have this tree-like structure. Okay, so then these different packets here, they would be the psi alphas, they would be called the branches of the wave function. Um, so each branch, is kind of concentrated in a region of uh, configurations that look macroscopically the same. Um, so, for example, they may look like an apparatus with a needle pointing to the value alpha. And now Everett's idea was if you have these wave functions, then maybe these wave functions mean that for each alpha there exists an apparatus with needle pointing to alpha. Now the configurations in the support of psi alpha, they look like normal situations that don't notice any other branches. So maybe in our world, other branches, other worlds exist that we don't notice. So that's, um, that's the idea. Inspired, so let me first say, it is a mathematical fact that if you believe in the Schrodinger equation, if you believe that the Schrodinger equation is true also for um, for macroscopic numbers of particles, then you're forced to having this wave function with these different packets. Uh, so these branches of the wave function, they do exist. And Everett's idea was maybe that means that, uh, that other apparatuses exist with a needle pointing to different places, parallel worlds. How do SM and S0 solve the measurement problem? Well, assumption one of the measurement problem said there is a unique outcome, this is dropped. If every possible outcome is realized in some part of reality, in some of the parallel worlds. There are limitations to knowledge. Or let me begin differently. 
people often say many worlds is bad because you can't test the existence of the other worlds. You believe that there are parallel worlds that we don't see, but <clears throat> you can't test it experimentally. That's true, you can't test it experimentally. I think that is a bad reason to reject the many worlds view. It's based, I think, on insufficient appreciation that all versions of quantum mechanics entail some limitations to knowledge. I talked about that yesterday. You can't measure the wave function. You can't distinguish between um, different ensembles of wave functions that must be different in nature. Limitation to knowledge means there are some facts in nature that you cannot observe. Okay, so in, <clears throat> in the many worlds theory, you have further facts that you cannot observe namely facts about these other worlds, the very existence of these other worlds you cannot observe. But notice that it was not just, um, just a postulate that you cannot observe the other worlds. It was a consequence. It was a theorem of the theory. It follows from the Schrodinger equation that no branch of the wave function notices the other branches. Okay. <clears throat> Uh, let me compare SM and S0. So there's here the issue of primitive ontology. SM is way easier to understand and to think through than S0 because in SM, cats and trees and rocks are part of the matter in three space. <clears throat> in, in SM, there is matter in three space and then you can think about what does this matter do and what does it look like, how does it behave? It's a matter of mathematical analysis. In S0, there's nothing in three space. So that would seem like it says there are no cats or trees or rocks. In S0, we would have to reinterpret language. We would have to accept that statements such as the cat is alive don't actually talk about any object in three dimensions that's called a cat but really mean that the wave function is concentrated in some subspace of Hilbert space that corresponds to live cats. So that may feel like uh, in S0, you have to make contortions, you have to <clears throat> bend over backwards to actually make sense of the theory. Also, as in GRW0, there remains a logical gap in S0. Uh, the gap between having a wave function of a certain kind and concluding that there, say, the wave function of a live cat, and the statement that there is a live cat. The logical gap that I talked about in the GRW context was if the wave function is concentrated on configurations of live cats, that doesn't mean that uh, in reality there is a cat, a live cat. Here I wrote, the mere fact that a function on configuration space is non-zero at some configuration Q doesn't mean that there is a world with configuration Q. Think, for example, of the potential V of Q of classical mechanics. V of Q is non-zero at, <clears throat> at many configurations, maybe at almost all configurations, but in classical mechanics, we wouldn't say that just because this function is non a function on configuration space is non-zero at this particular configuration. Therefore, there must be parallel worlds. Therefore, there must exist worlds with this configuration. That seems absurd. We would never say that. So why would the fact that, is, that psi is non-zero, psi, another function on configuration space, is non-zero at a particular configuration, somehow mean or imply that there is a world with that configuration? It seems there is a logical gap. Also, notice that Bohmian mechanics illustrates how Psi can have many branches without corresponding worlds. So in Psi, the wave function has all these branches, but the, the reality, the three-dimensional reality, the particles, the actual needle of the pointer consists of the Bohmian particles, and that corresponds only to one of the branches of the wave function, not the others. Uh, here's another issue. About, um, about many worlds. People often talk about the preferred basis problem. People often say many worlds is bad because it requires a preferred basis, but nothing in the theory, the Herbert space H or the Hamiltonian H or the state vector Psi selects such a basis. I think that is a bad reason for rejecting the many worlds theory. Uh, for example, in SM, in Schrodinger's many worlds theory, the law for M 
does select a basis, the position basis. It talks about position. It evaluates the wave function in the position basis, and then um, uh, uh, then uh, determines the m function, which is a function of position. Okay, so the laws are the theory selected basis. Even in S zero, we don't have a law for the m function. One could add a law saying that the wave function must be regarded as a field, well, not must be regarded, is ontological. In reality, it is a field on configuration space R3N. And this law would then select the position basis. Okay, so I tend to think that the preferred basis problem is not a serious problem. Another objection, probability. People often say that many worlds is bad because probabilities don't make sense if every outcome is realized. What do you mean then <clears throat> that there's a probability of two thirds for outcome up and one third for outcome down if actually both outcomes are realized but just in different worlds? Uh, actually, the, the issue is more subtle than that. So <clears throat> it's, uh, the situation I would say is actually not as bad as this objection um, uh, makes it appear, um, but I don't want to promise that there is no problem about probability. So let's look at the issue of probability in many worlds in more detail. Many worlds theories, such as SM and S0, imply that the statistics, frequencies of outcomes, predicted by the rules of quantum mechanics will be observed in most worlds, that is, most worlds make correct predictions, provided that we count worlds with psi squared weights. Let me explain that statement. So this statement in these three lines is kind of summary of the situation of probabilities in many worlds. <clears throat> it's best to discuss this in terms of an example. Consider uh, a large number, say 1000 spin Z measurements on particles, which all have the same wave function, let's say root two thirds times spin up and root one third times spin down. <clears throat> so, um, so the results of these 1000 experiments are like independent um, uh, random choices and always the outcome up has probability two thirds, the outcome down has probability one third. It's like 1000 tosses of a loaded coin that has uh, two thirds for up and one third for down. Okay, the probability distribution of, uh, of the number of ups then is a binomial distribution. So there are two to the 1,000 possible sequences of ups and downs. Uh, correspondingly, uh, when the wave function branches, whenever you do one of these uh, uh, spin measurements, then um, you got uh, two to the 1,000 branches, psi alpha, and, psi, and alpha then is a sequence of 1,000 ups or downs. Now in such a sequence, we can talk about the frequency of up. What's the fraction of ups among these 1,000 outcomes? So here I wrote a formula for that. Okay, you, you add a one whenever, for, for each of the 1,000 results, whenever the result is up. So you count how many results are up, you divide by 1,000, of course. Uh, now, most sequences of ups and downs have a frequency of up that is close to 50%. But if instead of just counting how many sequences you have, if you count the worlds a little differently, if you count them with psi squared weights, then it looks differently. Then most of the weight, close to one, more than 99%, is then concentrated on those sequences that have a frequency close to two thirds. Okay, that is because <clears throat> in this situation with these coefficients, uh, those, uh, those branches that have a sequence with 50% up and 50% down, they will have very small psi squared weight. Whereas those branches that have sequences with about two thirds ups and one third downs, they have 
much bigger psi squared weights. So if you add all the psi squared weights, if that is how you count worlds, then you're entitled to say, in most worlds, the frequency agrees with the Born rule. The Born rule says, oh, you should see two thirds ups and one third downs. Okay, so what is, so there are always some worlds in which the observers would say, oh, we've refuted Born's rule. The, the frequency was completely different from Born's rule. So in some worlds, uh, people will say, oh, we've just refuted quantum mechanics. <clears throat> but in other um, worlds, people will say, oh, the results are in, in agreement with quantum mechanics, in agreement with Born's rule. Okay. So now, Everett wants to say, in most worlds, um, uh, Born's rule is obeyed. Now, for that, you need to count the worlds in the right way. If you count just the sequences, you get the wrong result. If you count the worlds with psi squared weights, then everything fits together correctly. So what you would need would be something like a law of nature that says, whenever you count worlds, you have to count the worlds with psi squared weights. Now the question is, does that make sense? Could you, could you introduce such a law? Does it make sense for a physical theory to introduce a law prescribing how to count worlds? This is a kind of philosophical question. What, what is possible or not possible for a physical theory? Um, maybe that's a kind of subtle question. I'm not saying it's an easy question or straightforward. I tend to be skeptical. I'm not convinced that this makes sense, that, uh, that, that it's allowable for physical theory to make such a postulate, to introduce such a law. I have the sense that when a theory says, oh, this is my ontology, these are the things that exist, and here are equations for, that, that govern these things, time evolution laws, <clears throat> uh, so I've specified completely what there is in the world and how it behaves, then it seems to me there is no further room for introducing further laws. So it seems to me that when, when Schrödinger has said there's a wave function, it's governed by the Schrödinger equation, and there's an m function, a mass density or matter density, and it's governed by my m equation, then uh, there is no room for making any further law, any further postulate, such as a law about how to, um, how to count worlds. So I tend to think that in the end, probability doesn't work in many worlds, but it's a subtle issue. It's not, uh, it's not obvious. And uh, many worlds works a long way and it's a kind of, um, kind of fine point where it fails in the end. Um, other people have made other proposals for justifying the use of probability in many worlds. Let me mention two of them from advocates of the many worlds view. David Deutsch uh, had made this proposal. It is rational for inhabitants of a multiverse. Multiverse means the total thing, including the many worlds to behave as if the events they perceive were random with probabilities given by the Born rule. So Deutsch introduces in his paper, axioms of rational behavior, and then deduces from that, uh, that, um, uh, the, that rational people should behave as if these events had probabilities, future events had probabilities corresponding to the Born rule. Uh, however, this reasoning doesn't actually explain why we see frequencies in agreement with Born's rule. That is why when we look at kind of results about the past, if we don't talk about the future, just look at what, what has come out of past experiments, why they are Born distributed. That Weidmann has made a different proposal. He argued that in a multiverse, I can be ignorant of which world I am in. So that gives me room for probabilities, okay? 
there, there's a fact there are all these many worlds. I know that there are these many worlds, but I don't know which world I am in. So I'm ignorant. I could say, I believe I'm in this world, or I'm, I'm not completely sure. I, I only believe it 80%. And 20%, I believe I am in that world. Okay? So I could express my ignorance as a probability distribution. However, uh, I would say it's not clear why one distribution would be the correct distribution and others not correct. Uh, why, what, what it would even mean for one distribution to be the correct subjective distribution associated with my ignorance. Okay, so that was what I wanted to say about the many worlds interpretation. I also have a few slides about the Copenhagen interpretation, even though <clears throat> uh, you're all familiar with that. You, you've, um, I mean, the, the way uh, quantum mechanics is usually taught in textbooks conveys many of the basic ideas of the Copenhagen interpretation. But nevertheless, let me quickly go through some of these, um, <clears throat> some of its features. Uh, actually, it's not so easy to explain to explain or define the Copenhagen interpretation um, for the following reason. While Bohmian mechanics or GRWF or M or GRW0 or SM or S0 have few a small number of basic laws, you can just state on one slide, you can state all the basic laws and all other claims that follow from these basic laws. That's hard to do with, with the Copenhagen interpretation. Copenhagen interpretation is a kind of collection of uh, a rather large number of certain views. A basic question that we ask about each of these uh, interpretations or theories was, what is real according to this theory? Okay, what is real according to the pa Copenhagen interpretation? That's again a bit hard to say, but presumably the answer should be something like this. Wave functions for micro objects and classical macro state for macro objects. Uh, so somehow macro objects, they have kind of classical states and micro objects have quantum states. So that roughly should be the idea. And then <clears throat> um, um, macro, the classical macro states like pointer positions, positions of needles is then somehow influenced by the interaction with microscopic things according to Born's rule and the collapse rule. Uh, now this, um, this Proposal about what's real um, seems problematical because the concept of macroscopic is vague by its nature. It's not, not precisely defined um, what counts as macroscopic and what not. How many particles would an object have to have in order to count as macroscopic? Uh, how, uh, how much mass would it have to be, uh, would it have to have? Um, um, and then, well, that's usually that's not a problem. For example, when you um, uh, when you study the behavior of macroscopic quantum systems, um, that's not a problem. You, you don't have to have a sharp dividing line of what are macroscopic and what are not macroscopic systems. But when you start assuming that um, for macroscopic systems, one thing is real, and for non-macroscopic systems, another thing is real, then it seems like there has to be a definite fact about what is real and what is not. <clears throat> the, the, the spin Z value doesn't have to be real, could be wave functions, but it must be, there must be a definite fact about whether it is wave functions or the values of uh, certain other variables, positions or macroscopic positions or something like that. Next question. We talked about uh, the measurement problem and how to solve the measurement problem. Okay, so how does the Copenhagen interpretation solve the measurement problem? Uh, actually, <laughs> frankly, I, I can't answer that. I don't see that it solves the measurement problem. Okay, so uh, um, often I ask advocates of the Copenhagen interpretation, um, wh what do you think about the measurement problem? Sometimes they say things that I discussed um, yesterday in my discussion of the measurement problem uh, that to me don't seem to remove the problem. Okay, so I can't answer the question. Then another key element of the Copenhagen interpretation is positivism. What is positivism again? 
Uh, okay, so let me mention again here a statement that I um, that I formulated yesterday as a kind of purified version of positivism. I called it exaggerated positivism. Okay, let me read it again. A statement is unscientific or even meaningless if it cannot be tested experimentally. An object is not real if it cannot be observed, and a variable is not well defined if it cannot be measured. So uh, this idea has has often influenced the views of the, the advocates of the Copenhagen interpretation. Uh, Here is again a quote from Heisenberg <clears throat> that I had already yesterday. Let me read it again to you. The idea of an objective real world whose smallest parts exist objectively in the same sense as stones or trees exist independently of whether or not we observe them is impossible. Now that sounds very much like an expression of positivism. <clears throat> Uh, not everybody likes that. Here's a quote from Feynman. Does this mean that my observations become real only when I observe an observer observing something as it happens? This is a horrible viewpoint. Do you seriously entertain the thought that without observer there is no reality? Which observer? Any observer? Is a fly an observer? Is a star an observer? Was there no reality before a billion years ago, before life began? Or are you the observer? Then does this mean there is no reality to the world after you are dead? I know a number of otherwise respectable physicists who have bought life insurance. Okay, so Feynman thinks that positivism is kind of absurd. Let me move on to another key element of the Copenhagen interpretation, the concept of complementarity. <clears throat> okay, what is complementarity? Here's a quote from Einstein. Despite much effort which I have expended on it, I have been unable to achieve a sharp formulation of Bohr's principle of complementarity. So Einstein is saying that he can't explain what complementarity is. And Bell commented, what hope then for the rest of us? If Einstein didn't understand complementarity, <clears throat> what are our chances to understand it? Uh, okay, here is Bohr's definition. He wrote, any given application of classical concepts precludes the simultaneous use of other classical concepts, which in a different connection are equally necessary for the elucidation of the phenomena. Okay, let's try to figure out what that means concretely. So here is my attempt. Here's how I understand this statement. In order to compute a quantity of interest, let's say, for example, the wavelength of light scattered off an electron, we use, say, in, in our reasoning, we use two theories. Theory A, for example, classical theory of billiard balls, and theory B, classical theory of waves. We, we use both of them for doing our calculation. Although A and B contradict each other. Uh, the idea is that it's impossible to find one theory C that replaces both A and B and explains the physical process. Instead, we should leave the conflict between A and B unresolved and just accept the idea that reality is paradoxical. So according to this view, reality itself is contradictory. That would be the reason why there is no theory C, no single picture that completely describes a reality. And at the same time, we can never observe a contradiction in experiment. For example, because we can only observe one of two complementary observables. <clears throat> For two non-commuting operators, we can make a measurement of one of them, but not of both at the same time. And since we cannot observe contradictions, the contradictions are somehow not a problem. This is, again, kind of um, a positivistic influence here. If you can't see it, then it's not a problem. <clears throat> you might think, okay, it's a problem for the theory if there is a contradiction in the theory, even if you can't see it. If there is a contradiction in what the theory claims the reality is. 
Okay, so on this slide, I describe what my understanding of war is. <clears throat> no guarantee that this is actually what war meant. Uh, well, you, you've heard war's words. It's sometimes not so easy to understand what uh, what war means. Uh, okay, so the, uh, the the situation is nicely um, uh, summarized in this Charles Adams cartoon. According to Copenhagen, we never see the paradoxical thing happen, but we see traces showing that it must have happened. Good, so these were my slides about Copenhagen. <clears throat> um, next thing I want to talk about is spin, and in particular, how uh, theories such as Bohm's or GOW would get along with spin. Uh, to deal with spin, let's consider n spin one half particles. Then the wave function, um, let, to fix the notation, there are different ways how you could write the wave function. Let us think of the wave function as still being a function on R3n, but now with values in spin space. So now the spin space has dimension two to the n, so the wave function is still a function of um, particle positions, let's say, in the position representation, but also has n of these indices, and each index could be um, up or down or plus or minus. So the wave function has two to the n components. And then, of course, for the Schrödinger equation, you would have to use the, something like the Pauli equation, <clears throat> uh, I, which I wrote here. Uh, here in this equation, A is the electromagnetic vector potential, B is the magnetic field, the curl of A, <clears throat> B is the electric potential, uh, sigma is the, well, sigma, the bold symbol sigma is the, the triple of the three Pauli matrices, and sigma K means it acts on particle number K, that is the, the matrix acts on the index SK, which is the spin index, spin index of particle K. Now, in Bohmian mechanics, you might have expected that Bohm needs little spinning balls to account for spin, but it's actually much easier. <clears throat> so you just take this equation of motion, where the psi star psi means the inner product in spin space. Okay, so you, like always with an inner product, you multiply corresponding terms and then add all of the components together. <clears throat> so, um, on previous slides, I had just gradient psi divided by psi. Now here I take gradient psi and then the inner product in spin space with psi, and I divide it by the, the inner product in spin space <clears throat> of psi with itself. So that would be just a real number, psi squared. And this is a complex vector. You take the imaginary part of that, that gives you the probability current. Uh, you just take that as the equation of motion. So uh, that means you, you just sum over the spin indices. Okay, so you still have point particles, no balls, no spinning, and these point particles move around, and now just the equation of motion is a little different. In the equation of motion, you sum over the spin indices. So the e electron is actually not spinning. Spin is merely in the wave function, as represented by the fact that the wave function is spinner valued. So <clears throat> this is Bell's proposal for how to do Bohmian mechanics with spin. Now, if, um, if the particles are not little balls that actually rotate, then what does a spin measurement do in Bohmian mechanics? So here's a diagram of the spin measurement. Of course, you're, you're familiar with that, with this specially shaped magnet <clears throat> where a beam of particles is sent through and uh, um, the spin up part uh, is deflected upwards and the spin down part is deflected downwards. This uh, part of the picture shows what you would expect classically. This is what you actually see and what is predicted quantum mechanically. So <clears throat> let's do it with a single particle. <clears throat> you have a wave function psi of x. I haven't written the x here. It has two components, the up uh, component and the down component. Each, of course, is still a, a function of x. Now that flies through this um, uh, inhomogeneous magnetic field, splits into two packets. 
the upper packet that comes out here is purely spin up, the other is purely down. Okay, so the spin up part moves this way, the spin down packet moves that way. Then we put detectors here, we detect the position of the particle. If it is in the spatial support of the up packet, if it's over here, then we say the outcome is spin up. If, it's, if the particle is detected down here, we say the outcome is down. So the, this measurement is not literally a measurement. Uh, what, what do you mean by that, literally a measurement? Well, literally, the word measurement would be the determination of some pre-existing value. Let me give you an example for that. When we say that um, we, we measure the mass of the sun, then of course we have the idea that the sun actually has a mass and that it had a mass already before we tried to measure it. And when we say we measure it, we try to do something that will tell us what the mass of the sun is. We discover the value of the mass of the sun. Now, this experiment is not like that. <clears throat> it's not like there, there is a value that's either plus or minus one, and now we discover what it is. But the outcome of this experiment is actually either plus or minus one, either up or down. Uh, but it's just the position of the particle in the end after this uh, flying through this magnetic field. The outcome is a random value generated in the experiment. It's not the discovery of a pre-existing value. Before doing the experiment, that is before forcing the wave packet through this inhomogeneous magnetic field, <clears throat> there was no fact about what uh, the spin of the electron was. Uh, this kind of situation is common with what we usually call quantum measurements in Bohmian mechanics or in GRW or in many worlds, uh, except in Bohmian mechanics for position measurements. Since particles have positions, you could try to measure their positions by detecting them. <clears throat> now, still, uh, measurement or not, what's the prediction of Bohmian mechanics for this experiment? Well, since we know that the uh, that the configuration is always psi square distributed, the probability that the particle will be in the <clears throat> in the upper packet is exactly the norm squared of the of the upper packet and the probability of down is exactly the norm squared of the down, which are the same as the norm squared of the first, the upper component of the wave function, of the initial wave function or the lower component. So this prediction is actually empirically correct. And the same could be done if you, <clears throat> if you rotate the magnet, if you have the uh, magnetic field pointing in any other direction, you could do a stern galloff experiment in any direction in space. Uh, it's always empirically correct. Uh, you get out the, the same prediction as from the usual quantum formalism. So in particular, Bohmian mechanics is compatible with non-commuting operators, such as the, the spin operator, okay, the spin operator in direction, in any direction A that you choose. So that complements something that I said already yesterday. Now, some authors felt that electrons should have an actual spin vector. Uh, like uh, some felt maybe it, it should be a rotating ball. And if it rotates, then it has a particular action of rotation and a particular velocity of rotation. So th it should have a spin vector that points along this axis of rotation and whose magnitude gives you the, the speed of rotation. Here is why the most natural proposal in this direction due to Bohm, Schiller, and Tiamno in the 1950s is unconvincing. Consider a single electron. So they assumed that <clears throat> the ontology, wh what exists is the psi function, the position of the particle, and an actual value, an actual vector for the, uh, for the spin vector. And they proposed the law that this actual spin vector is given by this expression um, for, with the, uh, the, the actual position inserted. So when you insert the actual position, then psi is just a, uh, has two complex numbers, and it's a spinner. And this thing here is the corresponding, the corresponding vector in three dimensions. So that's the direction in three dimensions corresponding to this particular spinner. And you normalize it in this way. So that gives you the, just the direction vector. OK, so that was what they felt was the most natural choice for an actual spin vector. Now, if 
a particle has an actual spin vector, then it would be natural to expect that the outcome of a spin measurement of a stern gerlach experiment is just the z component. Let's say if the experiment is um, a, a measurement of uh, sigma z, is the z component of the actual spin vector. But you can easily verify it's not. <clears throat> That's not what would happen in this um, bohm schiller tiamno proposal. The outcome of the stern gerlach experiment is actually a function of the <clears throat> position and the wave function of the object, of the particle. And their equations of motion don't depend on s. So this s vector actually has no influence on the outcome. It turns out that in the end, in the upper packet, the s vector will point in the upper direction, but it, it was superfluous. It didn't influence the outcome. So if you just leave this s vector out, if you do it the way Bell did, if you just keep particle positions and spinner valued wave functions, then everything is fine and you have everything you need. Good, so that was my discussion of spin. And now I think it's time for a short break. <clears throat>